friends, and welcome to All By My Shelf. I'm Miss Rachel, and it's so nice to see you. Today's panel is Puzzle Pieces, Rebuilding in a New Reality. Five incredible middle grade and young adult authors are here to talk to you about what it takes to build a book where the main character has gone through something that has changed the everyday, just day-to-day -day workings of their life. Our panelists today are Julie Buxbaum, Paula Chase, Micah Mulit, Marissa Mulit, and Robin Schneider. If you're a Glenside patron, click the link in the description below marked Glenside. It'll bring you to a list of all of the books talked about during today's panel that are available as ebooks for you to check out now, or you can fill out the form that's listed there, and then you can tell me exactly which books you'd like to have put on hold for you in hard copy when the library is able to reopen. I hope you enjoy this panel. Puzzle Pieces panel. Um, I would like to start off by having all of our lovely panelists introduce uh, themselves and a little bit about their book or books if you've got more than one. So whoever would like to go first, go for it. Hi, I'm Maika Muli. I'm Maritza Muli. And we're sisters and co-authors of Dear Haiti Love Elaine. Oh yay, with the props, yes. <laughs> So um, Dear Haiti Love Elaine is about 17-year-old Elaine Bohalan. She gets sent to Haiti after a prank goes really terribly wrong. And while she's there, she learns about a family curse and sets out to try to break the curse. And in the process, she learns about her culture, her family history, and even is able to reestablish a relationship with her mom. It's also an epistolary novel, which is just a fancy way of saying there are different pieces of media that make the story up. There are diary entries and social media posts and letters from long, la long lost ancestors. Yeah. And that's Dear Haiti Love Alone. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Yeah, of course. Um, hi, I'm Robin Schneider. I'm the author of The Beginning of Everything, Extraordinary Means, Invisible Ghosts, um, and my new one, You Don't Live Here, which comes out June 2nd. Um, so this is just the arc. It's not going to be paperback. It's going to be a hardcover. Um, but yeah, this book mm -hmm. is kind of my queer feminist love letter to uh, Gilmore Girls and the OC. Um, it's about a girl named Sasha who experiences like the big earthquake mm -hmm. and is forced to move in with her estranged grandparents who live in this very ritzy coastal town and um, the culture is you know kind of a shock to her and especially her grandparents expectations of who their granddaughter is definitely doesn't jive with how she sees herself or um, or her sexuality which is something that she's just figuring out so uh, when she starts to fall for the girl uh, two doors down, it's a big surprise to her. And it's also something that she wrestles with, like how to reveal her truth and like what is her truth and, um, you know, how much of herself can she put out into the world without feeling afraid. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my new book and I'm super excited to talk about it. Hi, I'm Julie Buxbaum. I'm the author of Tell Me Three Things, What to Say Next hope and other punchlines, and most recently, admission. I forgot to bring my book, so I can't hold it up. But it is the story of Chloe Berenger, who at first glance seems to have it all. She just got into the college of her dreams. Her mom is a B-list actress on her way to the B-plus list. And the boy she's had a crush on since middle school just asked her to the prom. 
Um, so things are going swimmingly well until one day um, early in the morning, the FBI knock on her front door and arrest her mother in a nationwide college admissions scandal. And so the questions of her life turn from instead of what makeup palette I'm going to wear to prom to am I going to be indicted and go to prison? Um, and it ultimately asks the question, what does it mean to be complicit? Hi, I'm Paula Chase, and I'm the author of So Done and Doughboys, and coming in September, Turning Point. But I'm going to be talking about um, Doughboys today in our conversation, and um, mainly because Doughboys is very special to me. It's, uh, I don't want to call it a boy book, even though that's what other people may call it, but it's about two friends, and my stories always tend to be about friendships at a crossroads, but in this particular case, these two 13-year-old boys um, are, on their, are, on, are on a recreational basketball team, and it's a very competitive team. It also happens to be that they sell drugs for their coach. So it's about how one of them is very conflicted about it, while the other almost feels like this is the norm, this is his destiny in some respects, and yet he is raising younger brothers, and he starts to feel conflicted about them coming into the game. And it's about how these decisions affect their friendship and um, in, in their family life. Awesome. Um, so... All of your books feature sort of large shifts in the everyday life of your characters. We've got a mom facing prison. We've got moving in with a strange grandparents, getting shipped off to a different country, um, getting paid to play lookout. Um, so I feel like we usually talk about world building as this fantasy thing, um, but it has never been an exclusively a fantasy, a tool of fantasy authors. Um, and because of these shifts, you all have basically had to create these two different worlds, the before and the after, whether or not those are on page, you have to sort of know what they are. Um, so I wanted to talk to you all about that and like writing and outlining um, your stories. So did you sort of establish that norm for your character and then shake mm -hmm. it up? Or did you discover their past sort of as you were writing their present? I am a notorious pantser. I wrote something from an outline recently and found it really refreshing. I've always been very afraid of doing that. Um, but for Doughboys, I definitely just felt the characters out as I went along. I thought about being in that position. I thought about what it would feel like um, in, in one character's case to have a parent who actually enables his illegal dealings and their stories, their backstories came to me as I went along. With admission, um, I did a, a structure in which it was, it's, you know, it starts with the FBI knocking on her front door and then it flashes back to then the fall of her senior year and each chapter alternates, which I have never done before. Um, and the reason why I did that was because I felt that the ultimate mystery of the story wasn't whether her mom did it. We know from the very beginning that she did. What we don't know is how much Chloe knew about what was happening. And so it was sort of fun to watch her slow knowledge um, with, a, with a, a narrator we don't fully trust. And at the same time to watch the fallout and to go back and forth in time. Um, in terms of understanding what I knew beforehand, I didn't actually know how much she knew. I knew I wanted to explore willful ignorance and what that feels like and what it would be like to be in the head of someone who is actively trying not to know something. Um, but I didn't, I didn't have all the facts in place when I sat down to write. And I would literally flip back and forth as I was writing. And I wrote it linearly, even though it went fall, spring. I, actually, that's not right. I wrote it, I wrote fall, spring, fall, spring, fall, spring. I should say, not linearly. The exact opposite of what I said. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so since... Mayuka and I are co-authors. I had to convince, AKA Forsker, to <laughs> outline because it's just 
uh, an easier process when we have two brains. And I mean, we're sisters and we think very similarly, but we're not sharing exactly one brain. <laughs> so um, we sat down and made like a really extensive outline that was like 10 pages long of every, not everything that we wanted to ha happen because we did leave space for the spirit to move us. But um, we, knew the really big beats that were going to happen in the story, the characters. And then um, even as we went back to start writing um, with the outline, some like one of us would have a moment of clarity and realize that what the outline said is not what we want to do. And then we just switch it off of that. Yeah. And I would say because our story starts off with Elaine in Miami, when we first wrote the book, we didn't really focus on her um, high school life. Mm -hmm. We just kind of were like, yeah, 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 she's from Miami and here she is in Haiti. And then our um, agent before we started querying was like, oh, I think there might be something there for you all to pull that out a little bit. So we worked on it, but it wasn't until we started working with our editor um, that she really helped us to flesh out that world before Elaine gets to Haiti. And we have, you know, the conflict where Elaine is trying to figure out how to deal with bullies at her school and just dealing with the fallout of her mother after she has this major outburst on the air. So it was through us figuring out as we worked on our outline and making those adjustments, but just having a really good editor who knew, hey, this is going to help set up the story and let the reader know a little bit more about who Elaine is. So that way, when she goes to Haiti, the reader is invested in that journey that she takes as she goes and learns about her culture and her family history. Um, I mostly outline my character's emotional beats. Like I did a roadmap of where I wanted her mindset to be and her worldview to be um, in the beginning and then sort of how I wanted that gradually to change. So I was sort of doing um, doing an outline more of like what was going on internally rather than like the external world. Um, so I always think that like people are either a product of their upbringing or they're a reaction against it. Um, so I wanted to play in like the pivot point between the two where um, my main character Sasha has to move in with her grandparents after her mother passes away. So her mom was the reaction against her upbringing, against this world. So she's always grown up agreeing with her mother um, and having this sort of misguided or someone else's idea of what a certain life would be like. Um, and then when she gets there, she has to confront her preconceived notions. And also the fact that, you know, just because this isn't a world that she feels super comfortable in, um, it doesn't mean that everyone else who exists in that world also feels like an insider. A lot of the characters who she really connects to um, are also feeling like fish out of water, even if like initially she sees them as people who like really fit in in this perfect world. Um, so for me, I just took a character who um, I could understand emotionally what was wrong with her and then I needed to coax her um, to sort of bloom, which is why her last name is Bloom because I am like the queen of like really heavy handed metaphors. Um, and I wanted to do that by placing her in a world that I was super familiar with. Um, and then to just play with a character who wasn't much like me at all um, in terms of how she confronts and moves through the world. But, you know, this is an own voices book. So for me, like, um, her questions about being bisexual um, were very much like questions that I had and the answers that I gave her and like the journey of self-discovery is a journey that I very much like needed to read about when I was her age. Um, so in that way, like I just mostly was dealing with character and having her um, rebuild a world that she thought she knew after stepping into it and realizing that she didn't. Okay, so uh, the title of this panel is Puzzle Pieces. We're talking about rebuilding and sort of these new realities that the characters are living in. Um, and some of the pieces in the puzzle of these characters' lives are the people around them. And so I wanted to know uh, about your favorite supporting character in your book to write um, and anything you can tell us about them without being a spoiler. Okay. 
Okay, I'll just go again. Hi. Um, so uh, I actually want to just briefly talk about like two characters who I think are um, like really important. They're like they represent two alternate journeys that Sasha could have gone on, um, and they're both the potential love interests, Cole and Lily. And when she meets Cole, he is like the golden boy. She is shocked that her grandparents think she would even be friends with someone like that. Like she can't conceive of it. And then I sort of break down um, like what makes him so intimidating and seemingly perfect and like he's caught in the crosshairs of the Me Too movement like his older brother is having issues there and um, the way he's idolized his older brother informs how he treats um, the people that he interacts with and he has to have a really big reckoning about that. Uh, so Cole gets caught up in this crosshairs of the Me Too movement and um, is willing to change and Sasha, you know, helps him um, become a better person and does establish this friendship with him that I think is really sweet and um, through her sort of needing to be a guiding character to him, like becomes a little bit less terrified of that world. And then there's Lily, um, who is just like the girl next door, like the fearless, independent, like artistic, badass, um, like, yeah, I, I adore her to pieces. She's not afraid of what people think. She's not afraid to speak her mind. And, you know, she really sets out to rescue everyone who uh, has a lot of importance in her life. And I love that about her. And she is the character who coaxes Sasha out of her comfort zone the most and challenges her to, um, to be bold and to be brave and to show herself to the world. Um, in, in Dear Haiti, Love Elaine, I would say one of my favorite characters is Elaine's mom, Celeste, because Elaine spends a lot of her life really wanting to like look up to her mother and be like her mother because her mother is this very high profile journalist that everyone looks up to in the political sphere. And Elaine doesn't have that relationship with her mom because she grows up with her dad in Miami while her mom lives in uh, DC. So in this process, it's really important for us to have our readers know that sometimes your parents are just trying to figure things out themselves. And Elaine does not, at the beginning of the story, she doesn't realize, you know, the different choices that her mother made and why she made them. And she learns more about that process throughout. And you can see that interaction with Elaine and Celeste kind of uh, grow as they learn to um, interact with each other better and to learn from one another. It's really interesting to see that. I think it's just like I was saying, just so important to know that your parents are people too, and they're not always going to get it right, but they're trying their hardest. And that was a really fun character for us to write because our mom is the complete opposite of that. Like we have a really close relationship with her. <laughs> so going through that whole process of having someone who is not as tight with their mother was really fun for us to dive into. I would say that um, one of my favorite side characters is Tatiana, who is um, Elaine's best friend. And I mean, I don't think that before you ask this question, Rachel, that I would say that she was one of my favorite characters, but I realized that like, um, she requires a lot of grace from the reader um, because when you're reading about her, you're just, kind of thinking, oh gosh, this doesn't, this doesn't matter. What are you doing? It, like, who cares? Like but, yeah, but in that moment, when you're 17 years old and just trying to get through the day and like have people not hate you, it's very easy to be someone like a Tatiana. And even though Elaine very much has our sense of humor, um, we have Aikas, and um, we really enjoyed writing her, we very much had an upbringing that was closer to Tatiana. So um, I can also identify with her in that regard, just having a really large, obnoxious, religious Asian family um, and having to uh, deal with all of the intricacies that are involved with uh, growing up in an environment like that. But I am going to say Tatiana, final answer. <laughs> My... Um favorite side characters are always the ones that change dramatically through the course of a book, where especially if you start out not liking them as a reader, and then you grow to discover that you don't know the full story, and actually they're kind of awesome. Um, so like you tell me three things. I love Theo, who's the stepbrother, who starts out being super obnoxious, but you see he has a heart of gold. Um, in admission, there's a 
younger sister who at first glance seems super irritating in the way that little sisters can be. Um, her name is Isla, and she sort of seems designed to annoy her big sister, especially with all of her successes, because Chloe, the main character, is not academically successful at all, and yet her little sister is sort of this academic superstar. Um, but as the, the book goes on, you start to see that Isla is sort of the hero of the story in many ways, and really um, just a genuinely hard worker who wants big things. And just like most women who want and it, you know, are ambitious and they make us uncomfortable, I think our first reaction to Isla comes from that sort of misogynistic or subconscious misogynistic place. Um, and then we grow to love her, or at least I hope the reader grows to love her in the way I did. The two care, well, and, and we're cheating because I think we all mentioned two characters. <laughs> and I think you asked for one, but the characters that, um, the side characters that I thought that I liked the most were the two adults, the two opposing forces that were mentors to my characters. We have Mr. B, who is the mentor to Raleigh and trying to encourage Raleigh and get some opportunities, and he's supportive. And then we have Tez, who is the basketball coach. What I wanted to do was to make sure that it was about the teen characters and their secret world outside of adults. But I think it's very difficult in Black culture to write a book where the adults are not a really kind of key part of it um, because there's just this there's, there's just kind of this cultural connection where you're either afraid of that adult that's in your life or you want to be like that. There, there's always something there. They're, they're, not, they're not easily ghosted. And so those two characters are very, very different. We have Tez, who, is, who considers himself the general of the basketball team on and off the court. And the effect that he has on the two boys, we see it throughout because one respects him and one is sort of over him already. And then you see Mr. B, who is this, you know, who comes from the same type of working class neighborhood and he understands where the characters are coming from and he's way more nurturing and supportive. So it was fun to write them both because they were so different. And yet we know that Coach Tez still sort of cares about the boys, even if his care is more of a selfish thing. Okay, so um, this is one of the questions that I'm adding in that I didn't send you all ahead of time. Um, what was sort of your journey into writing these contemporary stories? Um, did you always think you were going to end up writing contemporary? Um, did you try something else initially and then land on this? Um, what was sort of that, that process of figuring out, yeah, contemporary is where I want to be? So I used to write adult novels before I wrote young adult. Um, and so my issue has never been whether it's contemporary versus fantasy. It's sort of been whether it's adult or YA. Um, I, I'm not a huge fantasy reader. And so I, I don't think it would make sense for me to write fantasy. I don't quite get it. Um, so I, it's never been a question for me. I've always written contemporary. Um, and I, I think it's basically a failure of imagination on my part. Um, in fact, even when I'm watching movies, I, I get very uncomfortable watching anything not grounded in the real world. Mm -hmm. um, things that are set in space freak me out. I don't even like cartoons because they're not, they're not real. Um, I, like, I like to get, my, my imagination is very limited. So I only like to see things that, are, that would actually happen in real life. I, I wouldn't say that, well, first, um, I know that we, our first book is contemporary and we have a second one that will be coming out but we can't talk about it yet. Um, but I don't think that we will stick to contempor contemporary. For us, it's just a matter of finding the story that we're most passionate about and that we feel that we can tell the best at the time that we're writing it. Um, and growing up, I read all kinds of books, romance novels that we had no business reading, <laughs> um, uh, fantasy, uh, contemporary, sci-fi, it just really depends on the mood that I'm in. And I want to be able to write whatever it is that I want to write. Um, I think it's, it's exciting when you have characters, especially characters who look like us, who are able to be present in stories across any kind of genre, whether it's stories that are helping people to grapple with the pain that we feel sometimes, or others that are just purely rooted in the joy of being alive. Like we want to be able to talk about whatever character it is across whatever the genre and uh, to me that's exciting and 
I, I, for us, I don't want to stay only within contemporary, although I have a special place in my heart for it. And in terms of how we came to write Dear Haiti, Love Elaine, um, Maika and I have always loved reading. You know, we spent every weekend at the library with our two other sisters because our parents were mean and wouldn't let us watch TV on the weekdays. <laughs> so um, we checked out lots and lots of books and they were awesome and amazing. And I mean, I am probably like uh, Anne of Green Gables' biggest fan <laughs> and, and Hermione Granger and Alice McKinley and all of them. But um, we didn't have a lot of uh, role models that were young black girls just living life or even more specifically a Haitian American girl who was growing up and trying to figure things out and make stupid mistakes like everybody else. Um, so when we decided to write together, um, we, a, never ever finished a book separately. Yeah. Um, so it worked out working together. Yeah. <laughs> but we decided to write the book of our heart that we would have loved to see when we were kids growing up checking books out. So that's why we picked this. And the beauty of contemporary is that you can see yourself in that world, even if you aren't physically in Miami or Haiti. I mean, it's totally possible. Um, so yeah. I'm shocked that I actually write contemporary fiction. Like, I've always just felt in my heart that I'm a fantasy writer. So it's wild to me that I'm like four contemporary books in. Um, I mean, I always say that I keep my heart in one genre and I keep my bones in another. Um, so, you know, you never know, um, you never know where a story is going to land. For me, I always start with something that I feel I learned in my life a little too late that I wish I had learned about myself or about the world earlier on. Um, and once I like assign that sort of like revelation to a character who I find interesting, um, the world just drops into place. And sometimes it's a world that's full of ghosts. Sometimes it's a world with an illness in it that doesn't exist. Sometimes it's 16th century England, but most of the time it's third period English class um, in a high school that looks a lot like my high school and with a character who looks or feels a lot like me or like a character that I just am not seeing in coming of age stories, particularly whether that's like a bisexual girl who um, is very feminine and loves fashion and loves makeup and definitely likes boys, but like, what is this thing with girls? Or whether it's a Jewish character, somebody with an invisible disability, somebody with a chronic illness. Um, I think the stories just sort of build themselves in that way. Um, I'm a huge fantasy fan. Like, oh my God, I have been to Harry Potter conventions in like full Hogwarts costumes. Um, I hosted um, for Doctor Who um, a review show for them, like on the radio and on their website, like the Doctor Who reviewed site for years. Like I cut my teeth in the world of fandom. And even if I'm writing a contemporary story, I always write characters who are fantasy, like nerds at heart. Like even if they don't, you know, do magic, um, they are definitely Harry Potter fans. So, I mean, I guess that's how I cheat it and how I like bring my heart and my bones into like the same story. I'm like pointing at Mertz's shirt. She's wearing her Ravenclaw shirt. I <laughs> see her Ravenclaw shirt. I raise you my, like, I don't even think you can see it, but I have a sign in the back that's from um, the Shades of Magic series and it says Dream of Stranger Worlds. Yeah. <laughs> There was never any question that I would write contemporary. It was what I read um, as a young reader. And also there's, there was so much missing <laughs> in fiction when I started. I started writing YA and I started writing it because I didn't ever see suburban black girls in fiction, not even as a sidekick. There was always historical fiction. There was always, uh, I guess, like inner city stories, but there were never just girls from suburbs, like you said, living life. And that's why when people ask like, well, what are your stories about? I'm almost, I almost want to say nothing because it, because that's what it feels like when you compare it to fantasy or when you compare it to other genres, but it is just black girls, black boys living life because I never got to see that. So there was never a question that I would write it because there were just so many stories inside of me that, you know, would reflect those particular folks and they're, they're just missing all the time. So it, I, I like to read fantasy. I like to read horror. I love mystery. 
but I think contemporary will always have my heart in terms of my go-to. That's fair. What's the hardest part about writing contemporary? Oh, okay. Someone else, not me. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, okay, so I don't know if it's the literal ultimate hardest thing for me, but right now, well, two things. Okay, so you'll probably think of the second one. Oh, but for the first one, like, I feel sometimes, because this is fiction, we're just making up stories, but I can get tied down in some details sometimes. Like, if I'm working in a real city and I'm thinking of streets and stuff, like, sometimes I'll stop and think, well, would they have been able to get there that quickly? Or, right. like, think about logistical things that... Uh, aren't like the biggest deal in the story, but I sometimes wonder how much of what I want to uh, show on the page, uh, I want to make it as true to life as possible. Um, but then I do, like Mike and I do a good job of kind of like digging our heads out of the stand if we end up staying too long on something that really isn't that big of a deal. Yeah, that, that definitely happens. I know for Dear Haiti Love Elaine, we have one scene where um, she's visiting the Citadel, which is a very historical uh, monument in Haiti. And we were like, this takes hours for you to, you know, take a donkey, get there, maybe motorcycle up the mountain, blah, blah, blah. So we made it take like 15 minutes in our book. <laughs> but we were just like, this is what we're gonna do because we don't wanna get bogged down in the details. But I think something that, it, sometimes it's hard for me in writing contemporary is that I always want to give a little bit of magic or a little bit of, something to uh to the story and marita will <laughs> have to be like that's not the story we're writing right now but we can save it for next time so um it's it's a matter of making sure that we can do that i think for dear haiti love elaine we were able to incorporate magical realism because it is very tied into haitian culture and um that was a very seamless and natural way but for our second book which is a contemporary novel there is no magic but we were able to kind of incorporate what was um, a twist to be able to kind of get that feel of, okay, here's something that's a little bit off or uh, uh, something that will make the reader kind of uh, feel surprised as they're reading the story. And I'm also very, very curious to see what books will look like a year and a half, two years from now, yes. based on what is going on in our world right now. So when you're writing that contemporary story, like, are you thinking about putting in that party scene? Are, are people going to be uh, commuting in Times Square for a really dramatic moment in the story that like people would gasp at and be really excited for? Like, I don't know what things are going to look like and it's kind of driving me crazy like <laughs> to think about, yeah. It's funny because that's what I was going to say was my worst thing is knowing that the publishing cycle is very slow. Yes. Just wondering if your portrayal is actually contemporary anymore once it gets out there. And that's exactly why I know that I know that this is this outbreak is going to change a lot of things. And it makes me think about how to write my characters. I mean, we can't change it yet because we don't know it. But I, that's that's the part that I'm struggling with right now. Yeah, same here. I think that the hardest part of contemporary is you're limited by reality and time and space. You can't magic your way out of situations. Um, you can't create a magic portal to get through to make your environment more interesting. With admission, I was actually just thinking about this the other day, half of the book takes place in my main character's house because they're essentially under house arrest. Not quite, but they can't, they can barely leave their house. And so I was stuck with this one place as my setting. Um, which was limiting because, you know, she'd have a conversation in the kitchen and then she'd have a conversation in her bedroom and then the backyard. And that felt um, a little claustrophobic and stifling. And now that I live only in my bedroom and my living room in the backyard, <laughs> I was like, oh, I could have probably been a little bit more inventive um, <laughs> with those things. But I do think, especially now with this current moment to sort of write contemporary, it's really hard to know what the world looks like. And I feel like that's only true now. It hasn't been as true. I did feel it to a certain extent um, when our current president was elected. And I, I was having a lot of trouble writing teenagers who were just going about their lives as if the entire world hadn't changed. Um, and now again, I'm writing and I'm like, do I at all address this current moment? Or do we just sort of pretend I, these characters live in a contemporary setting, but in an alternate reality? Um, and I haven't answered that for myself yet. Yeah, 
I, I actually, um, with the last election, that was something that uh, paralyzed me as a contemporary writer in terms of like, how do I address this? Um, and like, how do, how do I find a way forward? Like, this is definitely a part of the world. And um, it actually changed my novel, I think, um, and made me sort of write a book that's a little more brave than I thought I would. Um, I, I had a family member who was very, very pro-Trump. And I remember thinking like how terrifying that was to me as like, as a queer woman, um, but also as an adult. And I was like, wow, you know, when I was 16, what would it have felt like um, to know this about, you know, to know this about a parent? And, um, and that's sort of where the story came from. Um, I was thinking about like the shift and it was so hard to write, but I just sort of tried to power through it. The idea of like, coming out as queer in a world that feels really accepting and then watching the world take a step back um, right after you've done that. And what do you do? Like, what do you do when the world is no longer a soft place to land and the people around you are no longer um, potentially people who have this like unconditional love and see eye to eye with like, with your point of view. Um, and I don't know if I got it right, but I definitely, um, you know, writing something that felt so close and like, you know, the more exaggerated version of a small fear that I had, like magnified into, I think how it would have felt to live through that moment as a teenager um, or how I imagined it would feel. Um, that was really hard. And um, I hope I did it justice. Like, I, I don't know if I could do it again. I think, um, I don't know how I would write about what's happening in the world today, but definitely um, going through a crazy, like surprising political moment was something that I just felt like I had to address or I wasn't being genuine um, about writing a very obviously like contemporary, you know, right now story. Okay, um, so this is my last question and one I am super passionate about. Um, why do you think it is so important to show the messy moments of life for a tween and teen audience? Because they live them, because they actually live them. I've thought more and more about how invisible a young reader must feel to go into a library or into a store and not see a book that represents some piece of them. And, you know, I'm not just talking about race. It could be um, gender. It could be sexual identity, it, anything. But to, to go into a store and see so many books that don't represent or reflect you and reflect the real life, you know, that everything doesn't come out perfectly. I mean, I had a little bit of, um, I guess, I wouldn't say pushback, but I know my publisher, I didn't end Oh Boys in this great, everybody's happy way. And that's because the life that some of these students live, these kids live, ends like that. They're still stuck in it. They didn't just all of a sudden stop selling drugs or stop doing what they were doing. So it's important to me because I want them to feel seen and heard. Yeah, I think so much of like what we see on social media is highlights only. Um, and it's, it's like the entire world thinks it's so vital to pretend that we all have it together at all times. And we can look around and just think like very easily, like everyone else is just going through this without a struggle. And my struggle is crushing. And why is no one else like, why is no one else feeling this way? So I think um, in like showing messy stories, um, we're kind of revealing like the secret truth of if you could see inside the head of somebody else, if you could see into the experience of someone else, whether it's like a mirror of an experience or like a window um, into something that like you don't relate to. Um, I think it's just really important not to just show people, you know, smiling on vacation all the time. I mean, I do... I do, I think, love a little tinge of sadness in my contemporary stories because I feel like um, in the end, if you've, written, if you've written a character in a contemporary world correctly, they don't live happily ever after. They just keep living and they sort of become a real person in your mind who's just like walked out of view. Um, so I think to do that correctly, like you don't tie everything up neatly with a ribbon. Um, so if you don't tie everything up neatly, then, you know, like why sweep the mess out of frame? Yeah, I agree with what everyone else said. I think um, we sometimes forget that messy lives don't just start at adulthood. 
tweens and teens experience really messy things. You know, they lose parents, their parents get divorced, they're abused. There's a million things that can happen to a tween and teen. Um, adult problems are not reserved for adults, unfortunately. And I think it's really important for uh, teens and tweens to see themselves and to see their experiences reflected on the page. Because um, I think one of the hardest things about being a teenager is you feel like your experience is totally unique and no one really truly understands how you feel. And when you get to see on the page someone experiencing something that you've felt before, even if it's not a direct exact experience, but you know, the same sort of feeling that a shared empathy, um, I think it makes everyone feel less alone. And anything we can do in this world to make teenagers and, and tweens feel less alone is good. I think for me, it's important to tell the messy stories because one, without them, it, life would be pretty boring because we all have messy moments. And a lot of times we like to try to make sure that we're living these perfectly curated lives, that nothing is out of place, but that's not actually true. And I think having those messy moments also allows us to know that it's important for all kinds of stories to be told. And it doesn't matter what the person looks like or what their um, sexual preferences are, where they live, how much money they have, everyone's story deserves to be told. And sometimes it just so happens that the most marginalized of us don't get to have those stories told as frequently. And I want that mess to, to, you know, to live and for people to see it and to grow from it. And so hopefully maybe even get some tools that they might be able to apply in their own lives to help them through everything that they're going through. So yes to the mess. <laughs> yes to the mess. <laughs> yeah, um, I think that I mean, we're all artists and sometimes we can get uh, really engrossed in the idea of like what we're doing on a sentence level or how the plot is going. But sometimes, and I mean the entire time, like you have to stop and remember, like we're creating this art to be consumed and the target audience, even though everyone reads it, is young people. And um, I mean, everyone's favorite children's literature scholar, uh, Professor Rudine Sims Bishop, like she talks about the sliding glass doors, the windows and mirrors, and how people can, young people can look at themselves through these stories and feel like they're not alone. And then at the same time, children who might feel like they don't have anything in common with another kid who lives in a different neighborhood or another country or has a different belief system, et cetera, et cetera. Like, they can realize, A, they have lots of things in common with people because in the specificity is where you see that we're all ultimately the same, like we're all human, we're all people just trying to exist and thrive. Um, and then at the same time, you get to get a glimpse of another person's experience. And I think that's very, very important as well to realize that we're all different. We have things in common. We have things that set us apart, but it doesn't matter. Like we're still people. Yeah. Um, thank you all so much for taking time out of your day to do this. Um, can we sort of go down the invisible line um, one last time and reiterate who you are, um, what your book is, and where folks can find you on social media? Um, sure. Well, um, I'm Robin Schneider. I'm the author of The Beginning of Everything, Extraordinary Means, Invisible Ghosts, and coming June 2nd, You Don't Live Here. Uh, you can find me on social media, um, most, mostly on Instagram, though. Like, I will say, just a little bit on Twitter, just at Robin Schneider. Um, and come say hi. I have a new puppy, and um, she is, like, the most glorious thing I have ever Instagrammed, and she's, like, my little, like, self-care queen, and she's just, like, there to help you, and, like, please come say hi. Uh, I'm Maritza Mouli. And I'm Maika Mouli. Oh, you can catch me at Maritza Mouli everywhere. Our website is maikaandmaritza.com. Um, yeah, I think it's easier because our names are a little bit hard to spell. So if you go to Maika and Maritza.com, I'll spell that M-A-I-K-A and A-N-D Maritza, M-A-R-I-T-Z-A.com. And then you'll see our socials across the bottom. Yeah, have, it'll all be listed. So Oh, see. yeah, it's going to be virtual. Okay, yeah, awesome. Woo, technology. Okay. Oh, yeah, we wrote your Haiti level lane. We forgot that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Like, what are we doing here? <laughs> Okay, 
I, I popped up, so I won the lottery. Um, <laughs> I'm Paula Chase. I'm the author of So Done, Doughboys, and coming in September, Turning Point. You can reach me at paulachasebooks.com. On Twitter, I'm at that MG book chick. And on Instagram, I'm that Paula Chase. I'm Julie Buxbaum. I'm the author of Tell Me Three Things, What to Say Next, Hope and Other Punchlines, and next up, Admission, which is coming out December 1st, um, wherever books are sold, and hopefully there'll be stores again then, and libraries, and we'll be out in the world. Um, oh, social media. I am Julie, <laughs> I'm at Julie Bux on Twitter, and at Julie Buxbaum on Instagram, and my website is juliebuxbaum.com.